Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Capsule Arts Podcast. Today, I'll be your host, Dr. Joe Menzo. And today, I am very excited for the guest we have because she has a lot of accolades in such a short amount of time. Switch to be super impressive, which means anything she tells you, you need to listen to. Okay. Valuable advice is about to come. So, I want to welcome Dr. Kristen Peterson to the stage. How are you today? Thank you so much for having me, Jovan. Thank you so much for your kind words. I'm doing great, but I also want to make sure you acknowledge you are also doing a ton of incredible things and putting this podcast out there to students, putting people on your platform. So thank you for everything you do as well. I'm super excited to be here. I'm super excited to have you. You have a interesting profession working in oncology. It's a growing field. Yes. Like that's probably just from, without even looking at numbers, just looking at the amount of job opportunities that open up whenever I, I was searching for a new job and different things like that. It's like, it was almost always on college. Yes. Whether it's outpatient, inpatient, it's always something, an uh, infusion center that's oncology related. It's always something oncology. And yes. it's fast growing field. And I believe a lot of us in pharmacist school don't know much about it. So. That's why it made sense to have you on. And you also have an amazing background with other things, but I'm going to let you tell your story. So if you don't mind, just kind of briefly introducing yourself to our audience today, kind of tell them where you went to school, where you were, residencies, things like that. Absolutely. So right now I'm a myeloma clinic pharmacist at the Duke Blood Cancer Center. And though I live in North Carolina right now, I'm, I'm out here in Durham. I actually grew up in the Midwest. So I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. I then went to University of Iowa to complete my pre-pharmacy coursework in pharmacy schooling. And then I was very lucky to complete a PGY-1 pharmacy residency at Mayo Clinic, where I did a lot of acute care. I kind of figured out where I wanted to pursue my PGY-2. And once I fell in love with oncology, it was kind of natural that one of the places that attracted me was Sloan Kettering in New York. And so I'm, I also feel very lucky that I got to train there for my second year of residency. One of the themes kind of throughout my talk and story for today is mentoring and networking. And so I, the, the paths that I took to get to where I am today, I feel like are really because of the strong mentors that I had. And even with my PGY2 director, he was really good friends with my current manager now at Duke. And so I, I feel very, very lucky and blessed to have had so many incredible mentors in my life to help get me to where I am now in the myeloma clinic. That's awesome. And I always applaud people for doing a PGY2. I did a PGY1, so I know the grind. I know the struggle. <laughs> but to go, go double down to do another year on um, to just where you want to go, I applaud you for being willing to do that. And it's not to say it's not a rewarding experience. It is one, uh, but it is a tough year. It's a challenge. And it helps to, that challenge helps you to truly learn and identify like who you are as a person and what you truly value. So that's one of the things that I really appreciated from residency. And I'm sure you kind of appreciate it too. Made you want to go do that PTY too, because you truly probably valued your experience in your PTY one in all college, yeah. right? That Absolutely. probably led you down this path and to want to specialize in it. So. One of the things I've always wondered, yeah, and if I'm wondering, I'm sure the students are as well. What is a day in the life of a oncology pharmacist? Like I've, I understand you deal with medications that deal with oncology, but it's like, what exactly do you do? Like, how is it different than other specializations? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I can give you a couple perspectives that I think would be helpful. So before, actually, before I started in the myeloma clinic, I was inpatient for about a year and a half, still at Duke. And when I was there, it was incredibly helpful because I, I was an oncology pharmacist, but unlike the myeloma clinic where I'm specialized in one disease state, I was covering a ton of different things. So I essentially floated between hematologic malignancies, things leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma, stem cell transplant patients. And then I would even work evening shifts where the solid tumor patients would also be on my radar and the patients that I was helping verify chemo for. So when I was doing that job, it, it was almost like a PGY3 because of the amount of things that I got to see. It was awesome. I mean, 
Of course, you can think of order verification from a pharmacist's perspective, but that additional clinical side that you're able to bring from a PGY2 residency is, okay, what is the appropriateness of this regimen that I'm verifying? Or what supportive care should I make sure that patients are on? If they're on high-dose cytarabine, do I see eye drops to make sure that they don't have a toxicity associated with that side effect? Things that people wouldn't know if you didn't have the chance to really dive into those topics above and beyond what you might learn in school. On the flip side, so where, where, when I was inpatient, I would say a lot of that was some order verification, entering orders, helping with supportive care. And in the morning, I would get to round. So I would have that interaction with providers, but it was more limited, I would say. Compared to when I'm in clinic, I think something people don't really understand is a lot of clinic pharmacists sit in the workroom with the providers all day. So the physician, nurse practitioner, nurse workroom, the pharmacist is sitting right there. When I trained, that's how it was. And so when I came and started this myeloma position, which I was the very first pharmacist in the myeloma clinic. So I got to- Pioneer. I love I love it. It was great. I, I got to decide what does this role mean? What, what do I do in the myeloma clinic? And of course that came with coming together with the group and deciding where they had big gaps in care and where they needed help. But it also was me just realizing doing the day-to-day job and then thinking, Patients need more education here. And on the fly, I can jump in and help with that. Or I didn't see that there was really consistent supportive care happening for our patients. Is everybody on an antiviral if they're on a medication that can increase your risk of zoster? Is every patient getting supplementation if they need IVIG? Those are things that I think when when our providers are so incredibly busy and they're working up the entire patient, some of those aspects of of medicine, they rely on the pharmacist to help with that. Drug interactions, drug disease state interactions, all of those types of things. So I think the coolest part about my job is so much is on the fly. So much of it is I'm sitting in the workroom and someone will be like, how do I treat this insane thing? And then you're like, okay, here we go. You know, let's let's figure it out together if we don't know. Or this patient is on 25 medications. How do we pare it down or how can you help the patient better understand those medications? So anything from really traditional pharmacist work of verifying orders, looking at interactions and disease state interactions, but on the flip side, also being able to jump in and help with those oncology related questions. At the same time, I have a physician come up to me and say, I have a patient with newly diagnosed myeloma. How do we best treat them? How can we adjust their medication so that it works best for them? They have this side effect. Does that impact the medication? They have these drugs that they're on with these allergies. Does that impact the medication? So I feel very highly utilized in the clinic that I'm in. That's amazing. And one of the, one of the things that I believe is not, is not valued enough are people who are coming into a new situation and really designing a program or designing a situation for the benefit of the entire system, right? So not only yourself as a pharmacist, but also to benefit the nurse practitioners and the physicians, because one of the things I always wondered is when I've worked at hospitals, usually the pharmacist doesn't sit anywhere next to the doctors and nurse practitioners. It's like, right. we should probably be right next to them so we can help them if they enter an order wrong or they're struggling with certain things, like we're right there yeah. to help them out. Exactly. That extra resource that's readily available yeah. instead of them asking where's pharmacy get pharmacy in the line like putting on the nurse and the nurse calls you and it's like yeah be it conversations um, instead of having like that direct line of communication to really yes. and so that's definitely impressive to hear that you started your own i didn't even know that so well, thank you <laughs> well, you know, we love, i love meeting pioneers in the field of pharmacy no. here and that's something that, that you initiated and the other thing that's interesting is you're also really doing a deep dive, not only on the disease states, but yeah. also on the prophylactic treatment me- regimens. Like you hear, you know, about certain medications, like, oh, to prevent nausea and vomiting, but you're also looking at how to prevent the possible adverse effects exactly. so I didn't know about that. So there's so many different layers to your job that's different than a typical um, specialization. So I think it's pretty cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. And a lot of that, I have to give a lot of credit to 
when I first came into the clinic, I shadowed a lot of the other clinic pharmacists and got to see what their style was. Everyone did things a little bit different. And so if I could give a piece of advice, just if, if that's something that sounds interesting to you as a new practitioner or a pharmacy student, shadow those pharmacists and get the perspective of a lot of different people. Because I wouldn't say that I've mirrored any one particular pharmacist exactly, but I've been able to take components of each one of their practice style and see what worked best for our clinic. So I really would, would recommend that students and new practitioners do that. What inspired you to be like a oncology pharmacist? Because I know we all have different things in our lives that kind of lead us down this path. And oncology is so different. I never really understand why people want to touch chemo meds. So yeah. kind of wondering what kind of inspires you to want to specialize in this field. Yeah, I have two stories that really hit close to home for me. Oncology really came into perspective for me when my mom was diagnosed with ovarian cancer when I was in high school. And to be honest with you, it it wasn't enough to push me towards pharmacy yet, but it it did pique my interest in medicine. Whereas before, I I have to be honest with you, I thought I was going to be a journalist. I envisioned myself working for Vogue, like very Devil Wears Prada kind of like that. That's how I envisioned my life. Listen, if you're listening, you got to go to YouTube, check out our outfit. I see it. it. Sorry, I'm done. Exactly. Ew. It was that. I mean, I was taking magazine literature in high school. I was taking creative writing one and two. And then, you know, my sophomore year, my mom was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And I was going with her to all her appointments. My dad was really busy with work. He couldn't help her as much. I'm I'm the oldest in my family. So I felt that responsibility to jump in and help. Seeing the impact of that and her surgeries, I mean, all of that was huge. But I think what really took that and amplified it to be oncology pharmacy for me was my dad, unfortunately, my dad had a stroke when I was in high school as well. And that was my junior year. And that, that really made me take a step back into what, where I was feeling called in my life. So he had a stroke. It, thank goodness, he still has full mobility. He did not have any permanent damage um, physically because of it, which is incredible. But he was started on warfarin and he did not get any education about warfarin. And I think, you know, being in pharmacy school and knowing how much we learn about that drug, even though now I think you're seeing it less and less in practice for a variety of indications. Now it's like very specific populations we use it in. Imagine, I mean, drug interactions, food interactions, life, everything can impact warfarin and, you know, bleeding and clotting. I mean, that balance is huge with that drug. And so my dad had a lot of complications, bleeding complications associated with that. And I remember I was like, I feel that I need to take ownership and review this medication, review the side effects, help my dad understand this medication. And I think that that journey for me empowered me to want to do it full time as a pharmacist, because I realized if my dad didn't get this, how many other people are in a similar situation? And how can I be someone that makes sure it does not happen to anybody else? Because not everybody is lucky enough to be medically literate. They are not lucky enough to have the education that I had and, and to have to, to know where to look even to get resources and access to that. So that really, that made me take a 180. And my senior year, I got rid of all those kind of creative writing classes and I did AP chemistry at after not doing honors chemistry, I did anatomy and physiology. You know, my entire schedule changed and that kind of catapulted me through my pre-pharmacy and pharmacy school studies. Yeah. And something you mentioned made me reflect on what you said a little bit earlier was the educational component. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with, with your father, it's unfortunate he wasn't properly educated on warfarin, on the different interactions that occurs with it, you know, yeah. believe the, the risks, the benefits, monetary factors, different things like that. And so that made me wonder, is that why is, is that one of the reasons why you're big on education and on quality? Because from my personal experience, I haven't really seen pharmacists educate in oncology unless it's outpatient. If it's inpatient, I don't really see them actually going to the patient and educating them. It's more the dose verification, like you said, it's more making sure things are up 
to date with the NCCN guidelines nice. and things like that, like the, the appropriate pre-meds, the appropriate dose, things like that, but not necessarily going that extra step and educating. Is that something that, you know, that personal moment kind of brought that into your mind to like to always educate the patient? Absolutely. Absolutely. It did. And, you know, when I, when I first started at Duke, I think we were not in that place where we had the capacity to do that type of education inpatient, just from like a, a pure staffing perspective. Yeah. Now, I mean, even four and a half years later, we're in a totally different place where that's the standard now. There is actually a dedicated pharmacist who does either, you know, discharge education, counseling on prescriptions and chemo counseling, which is huge for patients. It, I cannot imagine just, you know, thinking about it, you and I being a patient in a hospital bed, getting diagnosed with cancer, and then just starting chemotherapy and not having a full grasp on what that means and what that journey is going to look like. So you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that was one of the reasons that when I saw that clinic position become available, I jumped on it because when I reflected upon what was it that I was enjoying the most about my job, I, I, I wish I had more patient care, one-on-one uh, -on -one patient care interactions. That was the biggest thing for me. And when I actually got to have it was when I worked with a resident and I would kind of show the resident, here's, here's how I would educate this patient. Here are the things that they should know. Otherwise, we didn't have the chance to do a lot of that type of education. So when I really reflected on that, I'm like, that could be my role in the clinic. That could be one of my primary roles in clinic is to have a touch point with every single new start or relapsed regimen patient to make sure that they know what they're getting and what supportive care medications they're going to have to use. Because in my patients too, to be honest with you, my lower patients are usually in their 60s or higher. It's not a population where people can pick things up really quickly and easily. They, they really need someone to sit down with them and break down, what is this medication? Can you repeat it? Because half the things sound similar. Half the people use brand name. Half the people use generic name when they talk about it. And it's confusing. So that, that really has sparked my, when I want to self-improve and, and when I think about how can I do my job better, I'm always thinking about how can I help the patient better understand what they're going through. Yeah, that's powerful. And like I said, it's probably the same thing. Like in places I, I've worked at, it's probably just a staffing issue where yes. they just don't have that capacity to really educate the patient. But just think about with normal meds, like people don't ever go to for warfarin. If you don't really spread, yes. if you don't really stress the importance of follow-up appointments to get your INR checked, are you really going to go? No, you're just going to keep the same drug. You may not know about any vitamin K interactions, any herbal supplements mm -hmm. that can interact. And so that puts you at risk now. And then you learn about it after the fact, you know, yes. after you've had a clot or after you had a bleed. And that's how you're supposed to learn. Okay, exactly. it's like we're trying to prevent things. And so exactly. I think that's super impactful what you're doing. Hopefully, you know, you're able to continue to spread that to other places, you know, definitely provide insight, like be that, be that resource to help pharmacists implement education into their oncology circle, into their oncology field. Because that's something that's super valuable. That's something, you know, if you don't know that there's multiple site holes, you're not showing up. Yes. Are you going to get your treatment? Yes. And I think to patients, when they hear chemotherapy, sometimes they just go totally blank. Yeah. And I think you need to have somebody with enough experience working with patients to realize, is this the time, the day that they're diagnosed, is this the time to talk to them about their chemotherapy or do we need to come back around and have another ch chat with them about it? Because that's the other thing that I think pharmacists just inherently in their training, they, they're very knowledgeable and aware of situations. They have excellent situational awareness. Part of it, I think, is just all the different places that we're trained in and how we're trained to prioritize things, how we're trained to notice certain things. I just think we have a really powerful situational awareness that other people, as they're going through their day-to-day, -day, they might not be able to stop and understand this isn't the time to talk to them about their chemotherapy or this is something that we need to come back. And if I, if I don't think they're getting it when they're in clinic and we're talking about it, 
I'm touching back in another couple of days or the next time that they're here to make sure that I can reinforce that. So I think, I mean, that part of a pharmacist's role is hugely impactful. I completely agree. It's, it's a jaw shocking moment. It's, yes. you know, if, if I'm just imagining myself, if somebody were to tell me I have chemo, like I'm tuning out, but I just zoned out. Yes. I don't know what else you're saying to me right now. Totally. I'm just like, like I'm zoned out. I'm not paying attention. Totally. I'm just not. So I can only imagine if you're 60 or 70 years old, like the different things you're, you're focused on, you're reflecting on, on your life, you know, were you there as much for your kids or for your wife or for your husband? Were you there for your parents? You're probably reflecting on so many other things that you are not listening to this doctor. You're not listening about what's the next step. You're just nodding your head. Yes. You well, they start going through those cycles, right? Of like chemotherapy. I'm going to lose my hair. I'm going to be nauseous. But, you know, what do they know about chemotherapy if you aren't in the medical field? When you hear that word, when you hear cancer, people think hair loss. People think nausea. They think I'm going to feel really bad or I'm going to be in the hospital for weeks. And so even that, even being able to just break down what chemotherapy means is huge because that looks different for every single patient and for every disease state, which, you know, what, once you're in oncology, you better understand and can explain to people. Yeah, that's where, that's a great point. So. You mentioned something about being able to reflect during residency and that kind of helped you get to where you're at. And I recently did an episode, I want to say maybe three or four episodes ago, talking about the importance of reflecting. I felt December of 2023 would be a great time to kind of reflect like, hey, do you really want to pursue a residency if you're a student? If you already did your PGY1, do you really want to do a PGY2? If you're interested in pharmacy school, do you really want to do this? Like just reflect on your life, what you want out of life, who do you want to be? What do you desire? Different things like that. So I was kind of wondering if you can kind of just explain or give any advice to anybody listening that's kind of struggling, figuring out what it is that they're passionate about, what it is that they want to pursue, because I struggled with it. I know listening to this is struggling with it. You were able to find your answer eventually in residency, but it's a a process to reflect. So if you don't mind this kind of sharing how you treat in an environment for you to be able to reflect and come up with that answer, like, this is what I want to do. This is who I want to be. I'm going to go get it done and execute. Absolutely. I can. That's a great question. And I think so much of that can depend on the phase of life that you're in when you're reflecting on some of those things. I know, to be honest with you, when I was a student, I was so in the student mindset of like, I have to get this done onto the next thing. I have to get this done onto the next thing. I have to get this done. And I know before we were talking about, before we started the podcast, we were just talking about, gosh, there's, there's not a lot of pharmacy schools that were breaking down what the different opportunities are for pharmacists beyond residency in retail or hospital. So for me, I think the, the most important thing, and, and I want to make sure I can emphasize this to students, is that self-reflection during pharmacy school is so important. Don't wait until you are applying for residency. Don't wait until you are, you know, applying for a job after residency or after school. Each each semester, to be honest with you, sit and really think, what was my favorite thing about the semester? What do I want to do more of or see more of based off of that? On the flip side, which sometimes I think is even more important, what did I learn I really don't like? Where do I really not see myself? And, you know, my interest in oncology came from, it, it was just a interest in the material I was learning in the lectures. That's what really made me think, okay, I can do this. When a lot of people were saying to me, you're going to hate the oncology unit in pharmacology, I was like, okay, bring it on. And I loved it. And so even small sparks like that, are important to tuck away and just think, okay, I really enjoyed learning about that. Were there any topics that you found yourself actually going above and beyond to learn more about because you just were fascinated in the topic? Maybe that's related to pharmacy and maybe it's not. And I think that even if you're in pharmacy school and you're thinking about other interests you have, well, community, community research and community, you know, being able to reach out to the community and have that impact, is it, is it computer science? Is it industry? Is it 
the hospital setting. I mean, really reflecting on what things make you passionate and excited. You can take pharmacy and go anywhere with any of those things. So instead of trying to reflect on what area of pharmacy do I want to be in, think about what things drive me. And your skills that you learn in pharmacy school are going to help get you wherever you want to go. And I think understanding that you need to give yourself grace. Every single semester might look a little bit different. You might think, wow, I love this. I mean, I wanted to do retail pharmacy when I started pharmacy school because that was what I had been exposed to. And then based on the experiences that you have, whether that be with the topic or with something else, that could help you decide maybe I don't want to pursue this further, or maybe I want to jump in two feet to this and really go all in. Those types of reflections, even during a time as busy as being a pharmacy student, will help you in the long run. Definitely. And yeah, you're making me reflect again. I don't, I don't remember how far back this episode was. It might have been one or two years ago, but one of the things that a preceptor told me to do was to keep a running list of the things you like and don't like. Yeah. So keep a running list. It could be as small as I don't like ID. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, it could be yes. it could be that, or it could be something like I don't like patient education. It yes, does. I I like it, but just giving an example. So then you know you probably don't want to pursue a career path that involves that. You know, really yes. find the things you maximize the things you like, or find a position that avoids the things you don't like. Either yes. way, you'll be happy with your career. But it's one of those to where nobody can tell you what's meant for you. The schools. I get in trouble when I say this, but the schools, the schools all have an agenda. Okay. They're going to promote certain things that make them look good in certain lights. And they have certain things that they pursue. That's why if you go to the West coast, it's going to be industry and it's going to be, um, retail. If you go up North, it's going to be industry. Okay. There's a reason why Rutgers has a big fellowship program. Most people that go to Rutgers university in pharmacy will likely go into industry. There's a reason why in the South, if you're in pharmacy school, you're probably going to get pushed to do research. Re um, research retail uh, or something clinical yeah. that's just popular here it's that's just what it is okay and, and the schools may push that but that doesn't mean you have to accept that agenda it doesn't have to be what you yes. pursue with your career and there's so many different opportunities there's this platform there's a thousand different platforms that you can listen to to learn about different career paths but before even getting there what you said is the most valuable Kristen is really create a list of the things you like mm -hmm. you know the things you don't like. That's the forgotten part. People get to include what they don't like because you really want to be a find a career that focuses on the things that you like and you enjoy and minimizes the things that you really dislike. Exactly. And even if that's not, it's a hundred percent on the like list and zero percent dislike, at least figure out a balance where you could have 75% of what you like and maybe 25% of what you don't and realize that, you know what, maybe you get experience with something you don't like and you're you think about as a student, I didn't like it as someone who's going through rotations. I love it. Hearing somebody else talk about it totally changes your perspective. Having that open mind and reflective mindset, not only throughout pharmacy school, but anything that leads beyond will continue to help you progress in your pharmacy career and help you have not only a successful career, but a happy one, which I think is really important. Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's the institution. Like I, I did one of my community and professional practice experiences at with a certain company, retail company, absolutely hated it. But then I was with a different company and I absolutely loved it for right. my fourth year rotation. I was like, you know, community is really not that bad. <laughs> so it's like, it's, sometimes it's honestly the location. It could be or the, you know, so there's different things that you can always consider too. And that's why it goes down to creating a list that can be detailed. So it's not like, oh, I just hate this. It's more, all right, what did I really not like about this? Maybe I didn't like how many medications you had to push. All right. So maybe the volume is too much for how, for you to be able to work it. Right. Yes. Or from a store that did, I think it was like 800 or 900 scripts a day. Then go into one that did like 300. I was like, oh, I could do a 300 or 400. I got this. So, Man, she's as a pharmacist. I don't know if I could do eight or nine. Dude. Like that's just yeah. not, some people are high wired, fast move, like, well, boom, 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 they just go speeding and dollars. And that could do for them. And so it's really just kind of figure out, figuring out different things that you like and don't like and try to be as detailed as possible. And it'll de definitely help you come along that way. 
um, to finding the path and career that's great for you. And talking about careers, one of the things I, I always like to ask somebody who specializes in, in a field is how can a student that's listening, that's interested in, in oncology become oncology boss? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think the exciting thing is there's a lot of ways that you can get there. So the, the exciting thing with pharmacy in general, as we've spoken to already, is just all the different pathways that a pharmacist can go down. So you can be interested in oncology and think, well, maybe I want to do an industry spin on that, or maybe I want to do inpatient order verification related to that, or maybe I want to do clinical side of it and really be part of the decision-making process when you are selecting a chemotherapy regimen for a patient. So I would say, depending on which one of those pathways you want to go down would really help when it comes to the training. I, I believe with, with how much things are changing and with how much data is coming in constantly, oncology is becoming more and more specialized. And what I mean by that is even some of the smaller centers that are not these huge MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering, Dana Farber, they are beginning to specialize and have, okay, leukemia pharmacists, lymphoma pharmacists, if not even just hematologic malignancy pharmacists. Whereas before you were kind of just an oncology pharmacist, there's so much going on in the field of oncology right now. I see it continuing to become more specialized over time. And so if you really want to go down the path of a clinical oncology pharmacist, and jumpstart your career for that in the fastest way possible, I really do strongly believe that a first and second year pharmacy residency will be the most beneficial for you because it will help get you those years of experiences compacted into two years. The things that you will be able to see, the education, research, order verification, staffing, all of that experience that comes with being a clinical pharmacist I think you get the most bang for your buck if you really go down that oncology residency path. Do I think it's absolutely required? No. Do I think that it's becoming uh, valuable for especially large academic medical centers to have patients or um, have candidates that are PGY1, PGY2 residency trained? Yes. As you said, there's so many openings for oncology in all different areas right now that any additional specialized training is helpful. I pursued board certification in oncology pharmacy because that also helps set you apart. So as a clinical pharmacist, those are things that are going to be really, really helpful to get you to where you want to go faster. I have heard so many different oncology pharmacists start in different fields, start in maybe they just did a PGY1, maybe they never even did a PGY1, and they jumped right into pharmacy, but they found their way into oncology. and it's absolutely possible that you can be just as successful doing that. I think that when, when that, one, that is your pathway, getting involved with oncology pharmacy organizations can help you network to jumpstart your career from that perspective. So HOPA is one that I think about all the time, Hematology Oncology Pharmacy. That group is incredible. The amount of anything from community pharmacists to Every once in a while, we'll verify specialty pharmacy orders all the way to pharmacists that are practicing at MD Anderson, MSK. They are providers in themselves. You have the whole spectrum there. So the knowledge that you can gain from other professionals in that area through those organizations and networking is huge. That's my recommendation. If you don't think that you want to fully commit to oncology right off the bat, networking will help get you there if you find that that's what you want to pursue moving forward. Thank you for that, Jim. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jim, because the more people, I, the more students I mentor, the more I'm hearing students not be as interested in doing a residency. And so they're always trying to find a way to get to the career without having to do that. And so I wrote it down. It's helpful. You said hematology, oncology, pharmacy association that that's the route that you can go join that, that organization, try to be involved as much as you can, the oncology side at um, the job that you're working at. One of the tips I, yes. I always give people is volunteer. If you work for a corporation that has an yeah. oncology session, section, 
hey, is it cool if I come shadow you? Like, if you work for them, like, they're not going to say no. Like, you can't come and just shadow for free. Like, hey, do you mind if I shadow you and just kind of learn what you're doing? Because eventually that person's going to be on PTO and they're going to need, <laughs> they're going to need a good cover. So if you just kind of been there learning and then the next thing you know, they put you in, things kind of work out. Next thing you know, maybe you're in line to kind of start picking up some shifts. Be, be the second point of contact when it comes to oncology. And, and then you join Hopefully and you do different things. And then an opportunity could open up and then you go explore the ending opportunity with somewhere else. Or maybe they open up another position for you there at that hospital. Like there's so many different ways to either get a job or create your own job. And so you always have to yes. be creative and think of different ways. And I'm thankful that you mentioned Hopa. I've never heard of them, but that's now a great resource I can definitely share with anybody who's interested in oncology to kind of get into that field. It's like, you definitely want to network, attend these conferences, build your name and, and be able to use that network to create the job that you want. It's so true. And even students can become members of Hopa just because I also hadn't heard about it until I was actually in oncology residency. And how I wished I would have known earlier on, because that gives you a network of people to start talking to and potentially connect with as early on as pharmacy school. So I wanted to put that plug in as well. Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to find a link for it, including the show notes for anybody listening. So that way you can have direct access to that organization. You can go ahead and sign up. I'm sure the link will be pretty obvious to find. So please definitely check the show yes. notes if you're joining HOPA. Okay. So one of the things you kind of talked about is oncology is going to be specializing. And so I was kind of wondering, where do you see oncology going besides the specialization and within like the next decade? And what skills do you believe pharmacists need to have in the future to be able to stay relevant? That is an excellent question. I think the field of pharmacy in general, right? There's everything is changing. Healthcare is changing a lot. and I do think that pharmacists are in a really well-poised position to take some of both the clinical and foundational knowledge that they have from school and some of the other techniques that we learn from school, like how to influence a discussion to help a provider take your recommendation in, or how do you work interprofessionally with nurse practitioners and nurses and physicians? And how do you change your communication to all of those different groups? The, those types of skills that we learn, and if given the opportunity in pharmacy school, I really advocate that you take advantage of those, whether it's on rotation or whether it's in pharmacy school itself, take advantage of that because pharmacists, their skills are very very valuable. And it's unique to pharmacists. We know a lot about medications. We know a lot about how medications interact with each other and with our own bodies. So it's going to be something that people need forever. Our knowledge will be needed forever in some capacity. I think that pharmacists in general are going to see lots of different opportunities come up above and beyond their retail clinical hospital setting. Mm -hmm. into technology-based services. How can we find software or how can pharmacists be part of software that organizations can use to help pull data for their patients and better understand practices? Are they utilizing certain therapies more? Is there a trend towards something? Are they following the evidence? So that's kind of one pathway that I see continuing to grow. I also see industry. I mean, Drug companies want pharmacists' knowledge and want to work with people that know how to interact with other healthcare professionals. So I also see that continue to grow because the research in the oncology setting is absolutely booming right now across the board. Hematologic malignancies, solid tumor, tons of research happening. Drug companies love oncology. So I really see that knowledge being able to be utilized there to help better care for patients globally. Because if you can provide insight from a pharmacist perspective to these drug companies, most people working there don't have that type of knowledge. There's a lot of PhDs that are brilliant when it comes to certain scientific things. There are business people that can help mentor you and help shape those skills. 
but they're not going to have that knowledge. And that's what they really seek. I hear that time and time again, that pharmacists are so valued at those types of companies. So continue to lean into skills above and beyond just the knowledge that you're learning in school, because I really see that benefiting you down the line, no matter where your career takes you. You can literally end up anywhere. And while that sounds daunting, it's also very exciting because there's almost an unlimited amount of places where you could use that knowledge. Yeah, definitely. And from from the people I know in industry, the two biggest growing fields, oncology and dermatology. That is yes. a life. They love you. If, you. if you know a lot on dermatology, skin care, or oncology, you are a gold mine. You will get a job. <laughs> So yeah. if you ever want to become an MSL or switch into the industry, those are definitely two big fields that are right now, like everybody's super interested in and oncology is just so interesting. I'm, I have no idea because all these drug names don't make any sense to me, but there's, there's just so many different things I see you just hear about. You just hear is potentially coming to the market, potentially it'd be a, a new drug that can have great impact on, on survival and different things like that. And it's like, wow, like that is one field. I feel like everybody is throwing money at because you know, the va how there's no value. There's no numerical value that you can put on a person's life. So it only makes sense to really try to do everything you can to maximize sustaining life. Right. Absolutely. And, and so that's why I think oncology is so cool and so impressive and it's not for me, but anybody that's interested in it. <laughs> You know, I like to sell it this way, not that I'm biased, yeah. but if I, if I sell it to students, right, I think something that is interesting and has always been fascinating to me about oncology is it is so much more than the, the disease state itself. It is cardiology, right? Cardio-oncology is huge. How is that chemotherapy impacting patients' hearts down the line? There is ID, right? We are and, you know, compromising a lot of these patients. So what is the repercussion of that? And when patients get infections, how do we manage those? It's, it's unbelievable the amount of things that you see as an oncology pharmacist and you therefore help manage. So I'm very lucky to be at Duke because we, we have specialized pharmacists in all of those areas. And I love that I get to reach out to one of my cardi, you know, cardiology pharmacists and say, hey, can I get your thoughts on this or your perspective on this? And, and really get to work together collaboratively. You know, that, that made me think of a quick question. Yeah. I don't remember who I interviewed, but I remember interviewing somebody and they mentioned that even though they specialize in whatever they specialize in, that they didn't really utilize their specialization that much. Like they actually helped the team with everything outside of it. So let's just say, for example, it's oncology. Yeah. Like they basically help the team with everything else just because like the physicians and their practitioners were so amazing at oncology. It's like, they really didn't need them for that. It was like, make sure there's no drug interactions, like handle all the other things. Yeah. But in your situation, it sounds more like you're involved with both the oncology perspective and everything else, the other disease states that the patient may have. Yes, exactly. So I think it depends. It really depends on where you want to lean into, right? Mm -hmm. I... I love a little bit of everything. So that's why I try to stay up to date on internal medicine things and ID things in addition to oncology. Our clinics end up becoming some primary care clinics for patients because in the myeloma world, we see a lot of patients monthly. I mean, we see patients sometimes more than they see their own family members or friends. Once a month, I mean, that's frequent and it's it's not a curable disease. It's years on end that we're seeing these patients. And so when they do have blood pressure issues that come up, that is something that we're helping to manage or, you know, blood sugar issues come up, especially when we're using a ton of steroids. How can we help manage that? And while I absolutely think it's appropriate to make sure that there's primary care involved as well, I do think that we have that really special ability to see patients on such a frequent basis that we're handling a lot of other things. All right. So it's kind of oncology with a mix of amp here. Yes, exactly. Oh, that's cool. exactly. I mean, we, we, we unpack that. That sounds really, really cool. Thank but you. I didn't think about that because like, I'm, I'm, you know, something, but <laughs> it's okay. I, you know, it's like my think top thing. That. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're, I'm here for. You exactly. can do, cause you have to be able to be good at this. I'm not good with technology. So you have to be able to, we need people like you just hey. as 
Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. yes. Introducing the stars, the stars take over. So okay. when it, when it comes to, to what you're doing, it's just, it's super interesting just because, you know, you're getting that oncology piece, but you're also getting the amp here and a lot of, I don't want to say a lot, but I believe jobs are kind of trending to being more focused on certain things rather than being a mix of certain things. So in some internal medicine roles might be more focused, like really just want you to focus on it's like not diving too much into optimizing the current patient medications. We'll leave that for maybe the transitions of care pharmacists or different things Great. like that. And so it's pretty cool to have a field where you're actually kind of doing multiple things and it makes sense. Since it is a disease state where they're going to have repetitive session, repetitive follow-ups that you might as well also be checking the blood pressure and the blood sugars and other health things, because that can also be detrimental to the health. Like oncology isn't the only focus. There's other past medical histories or other family medical history that the patient may be, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the patient may develop in the future just because of family history. So it's like, you also want to make sure you're doing the preventative measures on that aspect as well, because product care, it still exists. Like you still got to have that type of management and that's a great point because they're going to keep, they're for sure going to meet with their oncologist. Yeah. They may not go see their primary care. So that right there is a big, yeah. big way to help them long-term have a healthy life outside of the oncology realm, outside of the, the cancer they were diagnosed with, but also with their uh, chronic disease. So that's pretty yeah. awesome. Pretty cool. It is some cool stuff. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. So. To kind of wrap things up, what would you say is one message you would like to leave our audience today to walk with? It is so incredibly important to have mentors and then, you know, really use your mentors, whether they're assigned to you or whether it's more casual, find people you connect with that really help you see this is where I want to go or I, I envision myself following a similar path to them, whether they be two years ahead of you in school, whether they be three years out of practice or three years out of school and in practice. And those can be people that help to open up doors for you down the line. Right? And so when I mentioned, you know, I've, I have been able to train at such incredible places. I feel so incredibly lucky. And I... I have to be honest, I've also been able to be connected with people that have helped me get to each step. And that's why I will never, ever forget where I came from, because that is what got me to where I am today, 100%. So when you have mentors that help connect you and kind of get you to the next step, for example, going from my PGY1 to PGY2, my research mentor piqued the interest of the PGY2 RPD that I was interested in attending. And he was like, wow, that person does a lot of cool oncology research. You're doing research with him? Interview there. Little things like that that maybe you don't even realize can make a difference can help bring you to the next level in your career. And once you get to a place you want to be in your career, and maybe as a new practitioner as well, I also want to make sure that I emphasize being a mentor and giving back after that is probably one of the most rewarding parts of what I do because the patient care aspect that tops it. I mean, the interactions I get to have with patients is the best part of my job and helping them feel like they are capable and they understand their treatment, best part of my job. But it is reinvigorating to talk to pharmacy students and to get their ideas and get their insights. And they ask really good questions. Pharmacy students, I'm like, I'm so inspired by this next generation of pharmacy students because they have incredible ideas. They want to really bring pharmacy in general to the next level. And so don't remove yourself from pharmacy schools and from that pharmacy student population when you get out into practice. That is going to make you a better practitioner, in my opinion. Definitely. Cannot agree with you more. Cannot agree with you. Thank you so much for coming on. I greatly appreciate it.